Could we please put our hands together and welcome Dr. Eric Almedo. Thanks, Darren. Uh, white hair doesn't mean wise. Okay, hi everyone. So um, uh, I'm Eric, and uh, an academic anthropology. Uh, what I'm going to do, and I'm French. Maybe you can hear the accent. So what I'm going to do today is share a little experience um, about uh, how and why uh, chefs uh, can shape alternative food networks. A little experience infused with a few theories and concepts. I'm afraid you cannot escape this um, academic part of me. So, uh, this the title of the talk. I work at the National University of Malaysia, by the way. And I've been in Malaysia uh, for 15 years now. Oh, right. Okay, so what, uh, what I'm going to start with is uh, sharing a, a story uh, which happened not in Malaysia, but in Vietnam, and it will be the introduction of uh, what comes next. Okay, so it all started in January 2019, uh, just before COVID, and I was doing some research, some field work in Vietnam, in the Mekong Delta, and uh, the idea was just to study the, the food ways of a certain community uh, south of Vietnam. And um, I'm sure you recognize these fruits and these plants. Uh, what I stumbled upon while studying this community, this ethnic minority, which I'm going to introduce uh, in a moment, uh, what I was really struck with is when I visited this uh, Mekong, Mekong Delta region, I saw a lot of fields like this, dragon fruit fields. And I learned at the time that there was big interdependence, economic-wise, between China and Vietnam in terms of agriculture. As you can see, in 2022, uh, last year, 55% of the fruit and veggies export from Vietnam going to China. So when I was doing my field work back in 2019, January, uh, there was a lot of farmers uh, from different uh, minorities. The, uh, there are 54 minorities in Vietnam, so the, the dominant uh, demographic is the Kin, which are also called uh, the Viet, and uh, there are 54 minorities. And many of these minorities work in the dragon fruits field. Back in January 20, uh, 2019, there was no issue yet. Uh, Vietnam could export the whole production of its dragon fruits to China. Until suddenly it stopped. And remember, it was before COVID, meaning China just decided out of the blue for this particular year, I will not buy dragon fruits from Vietnam. I'll just source the fruits elsewhere. So you can imagine the disaster. Dragon fruits spill over on the roads, rotting in the fields. And uh, this, some of the farmers, they were so down, so they, uh, they were just letting their dragon fruit fields uh, without tending them. And they were just saying, why bother harvesting? Anyway, there's nobody to buy from us. Until so, there was this, um, it was flower season. And you can see the beautiful dragon fruit flower here. And then when we were doing our field work, which initially was nothing to do with dragon fruits, but we were studying this minority, Thai people, in, uh, in Vietnam. So Thai people, nothing to do with Thailand. Uh, they are a minority group, uh, originally coming from China, like 10 centuries ago. And uh, you can see them in the north of Vietnam, but because they are the biggest minority, I think they are around 1.7 million uh, in Vietnam now, uh, you can also find 
uh, some groups in the center of Vietnam and in the south as well. So we discussed with some of these Thai farmers and what they sh shared with us was a unique insight, we believe, about what to do with dragon fruit flowers. Actually, Thai people learn to eat the flower of the dragon fruits. Not the whole flower. When they, when they plug, they just plug the petals, which are quite a bit, it's a bit like endives, and they leave the core so, it, uh, so the fruit, the flower can reproduce. And they have different ways of accommodating uh, dragon fruit flowers. One is very simple. They just blanch it with a bit of soya sauce and cut chilies, but they also make soups and stews with them. But the most interesting is the keen majority uh, in Vietnam, they don't eat the flower, they don't know how to eat the flowers, so they just throw them away. And so we got interested into these dragon fruit flowers and we decided to study them a little bit more and we had some, um, some experts in our team, so we took uh, the flowers to the labs, uh, to the chemistry lab in our university, and uh, we read some articles, of course, scientific articles, and we find out that these flowers have some very interesting properties uh, contained to the pigments. As you can see, the beta lines pigment, the one that gives the, the colors, so usually when you have purple color, yellow color, uh, very bright colors, meaning you have is the presence of these pigments. And these pigments are very interesting. Why? Because uh, they produce a very high antioxidant activities. And as you know, antioxidant activities is good for our metabolism, for our body, because it combats, it helps combating oxidative stress, meaning the process of aging, preventing cancer, you know, is about the imbalance of free radicals in your body. So these uh, flowers are packed with antioxidant activities that shields you and uh, contributes to improve your health. So there was an issue, no, initial talk about elevating. Uh, so what we did, we discussed with some chefs in Ho Chi Minh City and we asked them, Okay, can you can you try to develop some recipes? You know, uh, starting from the knowledge that this Thai minority have, so we can serve these flowers in restaurants in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. So they devise some recipes. So you can use the flowers, the petals, but you can also use the birds, like here. And this one example is a soup, a clear soup, and you can see that the birds are where well, you cannot see, but they are actually stuffed with. Uh, seafood muslin and uh, it was quite nice, quite healthy as well, very well balanced in terms of aromas and flavors. And um, we started very modestly a little bit of uh, a trend in Ho Chi Minh City about these dragon fruit flowers. So the keen uh, customers in Saigon starting to know about it and to experience it and to like it. So, it is just an introduction, and of course, you want to know the, the end of the story and the moral of the story. Was it a success? Well, yes and no, it was semi-success, also because March 2019, COVID started, so the whole project collapsed, and it lasted for a long time, and after COVID, what happened is uh, farmers and the Vietnamese government as well together find, found other markets to uh, re <coughs> well, new market destination, if you prefer, for these dragon fruits, uh, like Indonesia and Japan, uh, who were seen a bit more reliable than uh, China. So it was a modest success, was stopped halfway, <laughs> but we did learn some lessons in terms of collaboration between chefs, academics, and ethnic minorities, or if you prefer, indigenous people. So the question is, is this experience 
replicable? Uh, is this experience scalable, like in other countries? Maybe like in Malaysia? Maybe? So let's, let's talk about it. If you want to put a name to this little experience, it certainly relates to uh, the concept of sustainable gastronomy, which we hear about a lot in the media. And uh, maybe it would be good to start with a simple definition. Uh, you may or may not know, but there is an International Day of Sustainable Gastronomy, I didn't know until recently, uh, which is 18th of June uh, every year. Uh, this International Day of Sustainable Gastronomy has been created by the United Nations. And United Nations, UN, also came out with a definition, which you're going to see is quite broad, uh, about uh, sustainable gastronomy. It is cuisine that takes into account where the ingredients are from, how the food is grown, and how it gets to our markets and eventually to our plates. So it is the whole uh, value chain uh, with um, basically knowledge of the sourcing and every step. Okay. So, why do we have to care about, or what do we actually care about sustainable gastronomy? Uh, well, this, or maybe why does it work? So this uh, proposition is, on one side you have the, the commensals, customers, and maybe um, they feel a little guilt, which is often relayed by media and social media. You, know, you have to, to be considerate about the environment. So uh, that's a pushing factor, that may be a pushing factor. Uh, and then my, uh, on the supply side, Maybe for some of you uh, chefs, uh, at one point of time in your career, as I say, just a proposition, uh, beyond your passion and uh, beyond your projects, uh, you might be maybe in uh, a quest for a bit of meaning in, in, your, in your career, in your trade. And this quest for meaning and may intersect with the guilt of the consumer and that could uh, give the foundation of the success of the buy-in for sustainable gastronomy. That's the proposition. So, when we talk about sustainable gastronomy, the pillar number one is uh, what we call alternative food networks. So, there's a lot of academic work about it. And you can see a definition here. So it's about morality, morals of their conception. And it's about morality and it's about opposition, opposition against conventional uh, food networks. So you may wonder what are conventional food networks because this convention is not necessarily well defined. But we can simplify it by saying that conventional food networks are basically uh, globalized uh, supply chains. So what we want to do when we create, when we set up AFN is to extract ourselves from this global supply chain, at least partly. So the real question is why these alternative food networks often fail? Of course in Vietnam, uh, the little experience I shared at the beginning, it was because we had the wrong agenda. Right? We were not there to set up uh, an alternative food network were there to, um, I would say, understudy the food ways of a given ethnic minority. And after this, we tried to find a destination for a given produce, uh, dragon fruits and dragon fruits flowers. So we were not uh, with the mindset of shaping an AFN. That's part of why I think the experience was a semi success. And also, because uh, from the market itself, uh, the farmers, the producers, took the path of least resistance because setting AFN takes a long time and efforts and energy and resources. Whether when we exited the pandemic, 
uh, there was an opportunity to venture into uh, new markets that were ready to buy these gravel fruits from Vietnam, uh, Indonesia and Japan. So that's, that was the pathway for the least resistance. And it's fair enough, it's normal. You know? uh, so we have to take this into account when we set AFN. But in general, uh, from my little experience, I think also many people, many scholars, when they write about alternative food networks, they tend to omit some key factors that contribute to the success of the setting of these AFNs. And uh, they omit to view AFN through the lens of class inequality, social justice, like social justice for ending minorities or indigenous people, and power. And more importantly, where power is located. So if we look at the triptych of supply chain politics from a sociological viewpoint, then you have the three key concepts, social justice, class, power. Social justice is what you're aiming for. Uh, you want to create a short supply chain to, uh, to produce, to, to yield fair trade so the ethnic minorities or the indigenous people, they get, uh, they get the revenue that they're entitled for without middlemen. That's social justice, what you aim for. But who is going to buy the products that come out from your AFN? That's where we, we have to touch on, upon social class. Because uh, if you are a B40 in Malaysia, you may not afford uh, these kind of products. You know? Or if you are living in a suburb of Seattle in the USA, where we have healthy food deserts, I'm sure you're familiar with the concept, meaning there's no way around uh, that you can buy fresh produce. Uh, I mean, it is a um, very common concept in the racialized uh, suburbs of the big city of, uh, of America. Uh, the, they have to drive a long time to be able to buy an apple, for example. Hence the concept of healthy food desert. I don't think we have healthy food deserts uh, in Malaysia, but in Kuala Lumpur, sometimes it can be uh, a bit tricky to find affordable local organic ulam, for example. But anyway, back to, so to social class. So uh, if you uh, study sociology, you learn that most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, social change comes from top. Why? Because people tend to apply the laws of imitation. It's a theory that was devised by Gabriel Tarn, French sociologist. You can see it's a very old theory, but it still applies. It's uh, what the bourgeois did in France, you know, when they wanted to imitate uh, the aristocracy. No more aristocracy because uh, the king was beheaded and a few aristocrats with it. So, uh, but that's where the, the French gastronomy came from, as you know. It was an imitation of the royal cuisine that was located exclusively in Versailles for aristocrats and one passed on to the upper bourgeois uh, social layer after the revolution. And uh, this is what we usually do when we uh, look at social mobility, when we want to climb up the social ladder, we want to, consciously or not, we want to, em uh, to emulate, to imitate the social class that is uh, above us. So the laws of imitation. And third factor, power. If you want to perform social change, you need power, power as a mean, of course, but we need to know where this power is located. So if we look at uh, the morals of uh, supply chain, short supply chain, uh, or that instance, supply and demand with indigenous people at the core, like in Malaysia, for example, we have some issue in terms of supply. No? We have the issue of land rights. Uh, I'm talking about the peninsula because if you go to Sarawak, there, there are native lands. So the, the land belongs to the native communities. But if you are in the peninsula, and if you deal with Orangasli, then it's not their land. 
they occupy the land, but they don't have the land rights. So that's a problem if you want to produce something on that land. And the second, there are, all, there are some institutions uh, in Peninsula Malaysia that shape and restrain and control what comes out from the land. I'm talking about the forestry department and also JACOA, which is the Department of Aboriginal Affairs, uh, which, which is a colonial legacy and restrains a lot. I will not elaborate, I'm not here to, uh, to make politics, but supply chain is political. Uh, restrain a lot the way Orangasli can maneuver with the jungle produce. So can chef play a role with this? I think yes. Why? Because if uh, we are aware of the class inequalities that the social change come from the top, if we are also aware of the concept of cultural uh, capital and middle class, meaning if you want a change in society, yes, it comes from the top, but the one who will take it on and make things change is the middle class. So you need a stable, educated middle class, uh, and it's our job to educate as well, together, so things can change. So that's the leverage. So, regarding the powers of chef and its paradox, let's start by the paradox. Uh, we, uh, I mean, I spoke a lot about politics, uh, politics of the food supply chain. So uh, you may wonder, is it really our role as chefs to do that? Because this used to be our role, tradition of hospitality. We are in the hospitality industry. You all know this citation from uh, Bria Savarin, the famous gastronome, you know, inviting someone is taking responsibility for their happiness during the entire time they stay under your roof. Such a beautiful uh, definition of hospitality. And I think all of you here are living according to this uh, principle. And of, so that's one of your key roles. And second, of course, as owner or chefs of uh, private companies, restaurants, hotels, and so on, is to generate profit. And on the other side, we have customers Customer, when they go to restaurant, especially to fine dining, they want an Epicurean, Epicurean experience. Sorry, uh, they don't want necessarily to feel guilty because I have to buy these kind of products to contribute to the environment. You know, so first is Epicure. Second is value for money. So these are two pillars. So that's the initial foundation. But uh, can we change, and should we change the mindset? progressively, and what can we do, what weapon can we use to change the, the mindset, or what weapon can you leverage upon as chefs? I think the key concept here is power. You do have a certain form of power, I believe, and this is the definition of power, by the way, the ability to uh, influence or to control or direct others, which is a big difference uh, a bit different from the definition of authority, which is uh, the influence that is predicated or perceived legitimacy. So, it's the, so authority is legitimized power. I think that's very important because uh, there are different ways of legitimizing power. So this sociology 101, uh, there are three types of authority. Basically, the traditional one, which goes with the title, chef, CEO, manager, um, dato, tansri, and so on. You have a title, you leverage on it. That's the traditional one. Charismatic, well, you all know about charisma. I think many of the chefs in this room are definitely charismatic. It's almost part of the job description. And the third one is maybe the most interesting, is what uh, we call in, in classical sociology, rational legal authority. So this is the authority that comes from your expertise, your skills, or socially valued outcome. 
So in my opinion, I'm going to see it in a moment, I think chefs, and that's why you are so powerful, I believe tick all the three boxes. You have the title, chef, uh, which is a word that echoes a lot, a lot in terms of authority. M most of you have charisma. And I believe all of you have this rational legal authority, which I would like to elaborate upon. And this is what I'm proposing. So if we were about, or if you were to manage power, power as a mean uh, to set up an alternative food network, is you have to take power first. And I think your legitimacy is because your power is not coercive. You are not Jacoa. Second, you are producing legitimacy. And your legitimacy is much acceptable. Why? Because it is a nurturing legitimacy. Your job is to nourish and therefore to nurture people in all aspects of the world. So it's a very soft approach and that's why it's more acceptable. It's a non-coercive, uh, sorry, it's a nurture legitimacy. Third, is about producing trust. I mean, consumers are not fooled. They know the risk you are taking. They, they know the investment uh, you are doing. So they will correlate this in their mind and uh, th the trust will be established thanks to the risk, the perceived risk you are taking and the actual risk you are taking. And fourth is about shaping behavior because you lead by example. And remember, social, social change comes from the top in general. So it's a law of imitation. And the last one is about power, but redistribution, because you have this form of power and the ultimate act is probably to redistribute this power, at least for a portion of it, to some people, some communities down the supply chain, to your suppliers, to maybe indigenous people that produce some uh, some vegetables for you, or some ulam, or other things, and to which you will give the entire revenue without any middleman. So that's about fair trade. So, as a concluding remark, uh, I would say there might be one ultimate weapon left if we are talking about legitimacy. Let's go back to the original concept of sustainable gastronomy and we isolate the word gastronomy. So I'm sure uh, all of you or almost all of you know the etymology of the word gastronomy. You know it comes from the two Greek words gastros and nomos, which means the laws of the stomach. Uh, so it sounds like a very scientific um, kind of definition, like a hard science kind of definition. But did it stem from hard science? Gastronomy, gastros nomos, laws of the stomach. Because it looks like it came out from the lab, maybe from a chemistry uh, field of science. But in actual facts, no. Some of you may know it as well. It was coined in 1805 by a French, uh, sorry, French again, a French evasion, uh, a French writer. Jérôme Berchou, and he was, he was not a scientist, he was a poet. So gastronomy is a poetry invention. And I, and I think this is your ultimate weapon because poetry is an art, cuisine is an art. What you produce is beauty, and when you produce beauty, nobody can beat that. Thank you very much. Eric, thank you very much for that. Do we have a couple of questions? Yeah, but before we uh, get into these questions, I thought maybe I'd just like to to have a, uh, just a really short discussion about. Um, I don't. I'm. Not, I'm not sure. I've ever heard someone say that um, chefs have power. Like mm -hmm. the, I. I don't think someone's actually verbalized that to me. 
Um, and usually when I think of power, I think of people like He-Man and Lion-O and, and things like this. Um, and, and I think it's really interesting proposition that you've brought up in that we, we, we through the, through, especially through popular culture and, and popular culture these days, and I think we'll, we'll also be talking about that a little bit later on with one of the talks. What you're trying to say is that, is that through our work, there is a sphere of influence that we have mm -hmm. to, to, pro, to allow a, a different distribution system of different sort of ingredients coming from uh, different um, groups of people and bringing that into the mainstream. Is that, is that what you're trying to, to come about? Or? Uh, yes, it is. It's the, the power of inf influence, as you say. And I think what is, mo what is interesting and why it, it, is, it can work is because you have chefs, legitimacy that other people do not have. 